Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another installment of the EBI seminar series on science communications. I'm joined today by Saad Shahab. Saad is the Associate Director of Assessment and Research at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign Siebel Center for Design. He's been a camp coordinator for the university's summer program called People Designing for People, and he focuses on the practice of teaching and learning human-centered design in educational environments. Thank you for joining us today, Saad. How are you? Good. How are you? Thank you so I'm much for hosting me. Of course, thank you for being here. And I'm great, thank you for asking. So I'm gonna jump in with our first question, which is, could you give us a more detailed description of your professional journey and what inspired you to focus on STEM education and human-centered design? So um, my journey goes back to 2005. This is where I got my bachelor degree in chemistry from the American University of Beirut. I'm originally from Lebanon. Um, I then did my uh, science education master's degree in the same university, and then I taught seven years um, high school and middle school chemistry before I joined the University of Illinois at, at Urbana-Champaign in 2013, where I started uh, pursuing my PhD in curriculum and instruction. Um, so since I've been a teacher, I've been so involved in um, STEM education. And I love teaching. I love being in the classroom. I love trying to um, simplify uh, STEM concepts and STEM subjects, specifically chemistry, very close to my heart for, for students at the K-12 level. And then I am kind of pursuing this journey as the Associate Director of Assessment and Research at the Siebel Center for Design. My research interests are in collaborative learning and collaborative problem solving. Um, especially in STEM-based uh, classrooms that feature design and design thinking. Um, I also love to study the role of the teachers in facilitating collaborative interactions between the students as they try to solve ill-structured problems. And um, I got my PhD in uh, 2019. I joined the center. I work with a group of uh, awesome people around uh, research and research studies that entails the design uh, implementation and evaluation of human-centered design activities as they make their way into um, STEM classrooms and non-STEM classrooms at the higher education level and the K-12 level. Perfect. Thank you. So to give a little bit more context to what you study, could you give us a description of the Siebel Center for Design's mission? So the mission of the Siebel Center for Design is to practice, model, and teach design thinking using human-centered design to reimagine our campus, community, and collective world. Um, our building opened in fall 2021, and we have a lot of um, collaboration studios. We have a media studio. We have a gallery. We have our own makerspace um, where we host uh, courses, workshops, some seminars, activities that engage um, students, faculty, and staff at the University of Illinois uh, in design thinking and human-centered design and learning about design thinking and human-centered design. It has been an incredible journey. We've always been viewed as a campus resource. Um, we have collaborations going on with different faculty members from all over campus. Um, these faculty members teach STEM subjects and non-STEM subjects at the same time. We have a lot of uh, collaborations going on with local and state schools around bringing human-centered design to the K-12 classrooms as well. And uh, that's it. So to give more of a definition for these terms that you're using, what does it mean for something to be human-centered designed? When I joined the center in 2019, we faced the challenge of answering three important questions. Number one is, what is human-centered design? Number two is, how can we engage in human-centered design? And number three is, what are the outcomes of human-centered design? And this is where we needed to present an accessible and easy to follow definition of human-centered design, its processes, and its mindsets, because as I mentioned, the mission of the center is to practice, model, and teach design thinking using human-centered design. So we needed some evidence-based frameworks that we can build on to work with faculty and students um, on campus and be able to engage with them in uh, thinking about design thinking and human-centered design and co-designing curricula that brings human-centered design to the classroom. To answer the first question, for us, human-centered design is a problem-solving approach 
that relies on two key principles, which are empathy and iteration. So using empathetic techniques and tools, what we try to do is we try to connect with the people who are directly or indirectly relate, uh, related to the issue or problem at hand. And we try to think with them about the real issue that we are trying to uh, solve in here or we are facing in here. And then the next step will be to form teams and collaborate with one another in order to iterate and keep experimenting until we arrive to ideas and solutions that satisfy everyone. So that's for us uh, what human-centered design is. So it's not a final design, it's a problem-solving approach that takes into consideration all elements that can influence humans. And that's why I always say when you adopt a human-centered design approach, you need to think about yourself as a human. So taking good care of your physical health and mental health is very important. Taking uh, care of your team and making sure that everybody uh, on the team is accepted and acceptable and uh, making sure that you are appreciating the diversity in the team and the backgrounds of the team members is also important. And then finally, making sure that you are taking care of all others and you are also considering any implications uh, on society or economy or environment that your ideas or solutions uh, might have. So it's a comprehensive problem solving approach. It's not just like trying to design something that is preferred by a group of people or suits a group of people. A great example that comes to mind in here is the redesign of the MRI machine. So the regular MRI machine, a group of uh, people uh, saw an issue in that, which is the children didn't like this machine. It was for them um, very um, scary and it was a fearful experience. So what the designers ended up doing is they put together a team of people who adopted a human-centered design approach. This means they talked to lots of children, they talked to a lot of people who are directly impacted by that for sure. And they talked to parents, they talked to uh, child psychologists to understand more about what's going on. They talked to nurses, they talked to doctors um, in order to figure out what the problem was. And then the issue was not in the machine itself, because some people might say, OK, why don't we go and try to redesign the engineering of the machine or the functionality of the machine or the different pieces of the machine so that it's uh, the experience is quicker, let's say. But using the human centered design approach, the issue was the the children needed something that is more engaging, more relaxing instead of anything else. So as you can see, See in the figure, what happened is um, the designers just switched the setting of the room and the decorations around the machine. So it is kind of a, a story journey where the child is uh, 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 engaged in an experience. They are playing the role of the hero of a ship uh, and they go in that MRI machine and they are playing that role of the hero of the ship. So at some point in time, they are asked to stand still so that the monsters don't hear them moving, etc. So it was a, just a simple change in the design that didn't cost a lot, but it was a very innovative solution to a problem that this population was suffering from. So that's why we always say if you adopt a human-centered design approach and follow um, the processes properly, you most probably are going to end up with an innovative solution to a problem that is different from many other solutions. And it can be very, very simple, more than you can imagine. The second question that we, uh, we were uh, faced with was, how can we implement human-centered design? And that's where uh, myself and, and, and a team that I have started relying on um, literature of human-centered design and models of human-centered design that are out there, and they are a lot, to kind of think of human-centered design as a set of design spaces, which are the understand space, synthesize space, ideate space, prototype space, and implement space. And then what we did is we took each one of these spaces and we chunked it down into a set of uh, processes that are easy to understand and easy to associate with actual practices that a teacher can do with their students in the class. Um, for example, when I talk about the understand space, I am talking about four important processes, which are exploration, empathizing, observing, and reflecting. 
And you can tie, for example, the empathize process to a set of practices like interviewing or uh, or going and immersing yourself in a certain experience. So you are able to put yourself in the shoes of those people who are uh, facing that issue. Um, and you can easily measure and train students and prepare them to do that type of, of practice. So that was for us like the human-centered design approach condensed into that model. And then the last question was, do I get some outcomes out of engaging in human-centered design experiences? Do I get anything if I learn about these processes that I talked about and put them in action? And the answer is yes, research tells us that when engaged in human-centered design approach, when you are engaged in human-centered design uh, experiences, over time, you will be able to develop a set of six key mindsets, which are very relevant to any 21st century workspace. And these mindsets are human-centeredness, creativity, collaboration, communication, experimentation, and metacognition, which is that idea of reflection and thinking about thinking. Thank you so much. You give a very broad and very yet yeah, detailed description of what human-centered designing involves. So putting this into context of your STEM background, in what ways does a STEM classroom specifically call for the need of human-centered design? So human-centered design is very relevant to a STEM classroom uh, because I think it brings that layer of authenticity to any problem you are trying to solve in a STEM classroom. These days, I mean, there are many students who try to avoid STEM classrooms because by default, we know that STEM classrooms uh, entail hard concepts and difficult concepts. And STEM classrooms are only created for gifted students or the genius in the class, you know, or the smart people, which is not, I think, the case. I think people have developed this uh, or perceive uh, STEM classrooms the way I described because STEM concepts in STEM classrooms are taught in a very difficult fashion and in a very abstract way. Students do not realize the applicability of the concepts in their real life uh, activities or in solving real life challenges, right? They, they feel that disconnect between what I'm learning in the class, if I'm learning it, and how do, does this apply to my everyday life activities? So when you bring human-centered design elements um, into STEM classrooms, you are connecting these STEM concepts to actual real-world problem solving. You are encouraging all the students to think about what they want to do and what issues they want to tackle and what problems they want to solve. And you are encouraging them to talk to each other and talk to other people in order to form an understanding and motivation of that problem towards solving that problem. So that's what I feel HCD can bring into the STEM classroom. It can, I know that there are lots of um, pedagogical approaches that are very effective in STEM education and STEM classrooms, uh, inquiry-based learning, project-based learning, problem-based learning, all of these are very effective approaches. We have a lot of research that shows uh, positive impacts on students' learning because all of these approaches are student-centered approaches. They give a lot of agency for the students. They give them a, a space to apply the concepts of STEM as they learn about them. But what's nice about the human-centered design approach, I think it advances those approaches a little bit more by adding more meaning and more relevancy and more connections to what the people want. It has that layer of interactivity and interactions between different stakeholders, including the students who are playing the role of the designer or the role of uh, the leaders on the project. So once they end up with a solution, the students feel that they have solved a real world issue for a group of people. And they have thought about the implications of whatever they came up with on society, economy, and environment. So putting all this together, what do you hope for the future of human-centered design and its role in STEM education? So I hope that the human-centered design approach keep making it to more and more 
um, STEM-based environments or um, STEM learning environments, whether in the high higher education or K-12 environments, because I think it's a great means to uh, real-world problem solving. And it offers, again, uh, a, a way to contextualize problem solving. And it offers a way where you can help the students or engage them in authentic learning environments where they are really facing or trying to solve or address a real world challenge. And our world today is full of challenges. And who knows, instead of those students just working on projects um, that help them learn something for sure and deliver something at the end, Let's try and see if they work on real world problems using the human centered design approach. Maybe they will be able to arrive uh, to an innovative solution that can help us make progress towards addressing those challenges. So that's that's number one. Number two, I think bringing human centered design to the STEM classroom can help teachers talk about or engage with their students in discussions around ethical considerations of um, solutions to real world problems, especially when approached from a STEM angle or STEM dimension. Because many of the times in STEM learning environments, the students rush towards the solution. They want to see uh, uh, something happening, like let me solve the problem. Uh, here's an idea to that issue. What, what human-centered design adds to the story or brings to the table is that let's take a step backward. Let's try to understand and define the problem first properly and engage the people who might be facing some issues with that problem or they are directly connected to it or associated with it. Let's try to form um, groups uh, around that problem. Let's try to learn from one another. Let's try to learn from, from those people to figure out what the real issue is before we start seeing opportunities for ideation and opportunities for creating prototypes. So instead of directly rushing to the ideation prototyping phase, let's take a step backwards towards more understanding, more synthesizing, more realization of what is what are the appropriate opportunities um, for, for, for ideas and prototypes? And then what are the implications of those opportunities on humanity, on society, uh, on, on um, environment, on economy, before we rush towards technology and let's do it and here's something crazy and wild, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last thing is I feel, I really hope for human-centered design to keep making it into STEM-based uh, learning environments because it opens the gate wide for collaborative problem solving and collaborative learning, which is something that we miss sometimes in STEM-based environments, because usually, uh, you know, these environments are based on the model of the hero and one person will be the gifted or the smart or the genius in the group who will take the lead on things and make stuff happen. Hopefully when you add the human-centered design element, this model cannot work because you can't really adopt a human-centered design approach and be one person doing everything. It's so hard to do everything if you adopt a human-centered design approach. You need to figure out ways where you can form teams that are functional and have different expertise, and you need to learn how to communicate and tell your story to those teams. Uh, you need to think about if you are an engineer and you are working with a graphic designer, let's say, or a computer scientist or someone who's an artist, how can you communicate your ideas to that person so this person is with you in the same space um, to be able to help you make progress on the challenge? You need to really learn how to collaborate, how to function in a team, and HC bringing human-centered design to STEM classrooms gives teachers the opportunity for students to learn about and practice real world collaborative problem solving where they are, uh, they have to be team players and they have to think about others in the team and they have to know when to ask for help and when to uh, communicate their ideas precisely and accurately and clearly to other people who may be having different ideas as well and wanting to come with them together to the same space to make progress on uh, solving the problem.
What a great note to end on. So that does about does it for all of our questions. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us. Thank you for giving such in-depth answers and painting a better picture of what human-centered design is and its role in STEM educations. So thank you so much again. The EBI and myself wish you all the best of luck in your future endeavors and you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Logan. Thank you uh, to you and your team. I know that you work on a team as well. I highly appreciate this opportunity and I'm honored to be with you today. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for checking out the EBI seminar series on science communication. If you've enjoyed this video, please feel free to like and subscribe to our channel for more content on how science is communicated. Be sure to follow along for future installments or check out our previous series and explore social media, which are all linked in the description below. Thanks for watching and see you next time.